This is Investing Ideas by ValueInvestAsia.com. Welcome to Investing Ideas. I'm Stanley. This week, we chat with Kelvin Seto, the co-founder of 10X Capital Private Limited. Kelvin focuses in investment educational courses and runs a very popular growth investing course here in Singapore. Today, Kelvin is sharing with us one of the growth stock that he is vested in himself, Hema Care Corporation. Ironically, we have been preparing for this interview for weeks and just a day before our shooting of this interview, Hema Care actually got a buyout offer from Charles River. Today, the deal has already been completed, but the key of our interview is really to understand from investors like Kelvin about his thought process behind how he invests in his stocks. So I have a very fascinating chat with Kelvin and hope you enjoy it as well. Here we go. From valueinvestasia.com, this is Investing Ideas, where we talk to investors from all walks of life, learn from them, and find out some of their favorite investment ideas. Okay, welcome everyone for another episode of our Investing Ideas. Uh, this is season two of our investing ideas and we have actually been in, uh, talking to many many great investors and uh, i'm particularly very excited to speak to uh, these investors uh, this investor today uh, he's none other than the co-founder of uh, 10x capital kelvin sito hello kelvin Hey Stanley, it's always nice to be on your uh, podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're doing a lot of great work. Thank you very much. Yeah, you too. I've been following you on Facebook for quite quite a, uh, I guess almost a few years now, and uh, you have always been sharing very very great thoughts, and I've been learning a lot from you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think let's go back a little bit uh in time uh to explain uh maybe how how do you actually got started and uh, uh into investing and now. Uh, why, why did you end up developing a passion for it? All right. Um, so, you know, like from young primary school, I was always uh, excelling very well in, in my academics. And I thought that I would do really well for PSLE, but boy, I was so wrong because when, when my PSLE results came out, I, I actually got to normal academic. Oh, okay. So that, that, that got me, a, that, that was like a, a wake up call for me. So um, when I went to uh, uh, Tamasic, I mean, sorry, then after subsidy, I went to Tamasic Poly, mm. and I was naturally uh, quite competitive because I knew that at the back, my end goal was to actually got, get into a very reputable university in Singapore. Okay. And for several semesters, I was wanting to get a top student of certain modules, but unfortunately, I did not. So I felt like you know this is a game that I couldn't play, play very well, and I couldn't sort of win very well, right? Um, but I got to know this lecturer of mine, uh, Mr. Daniel Ng, he was formerly a fund manager. And I think that he would spice things up during his lectures. He would tell us about his uh, uh, experiences managing portfolios. He would recommend us really great books to read. So for example, one book is called uh, One Up on Wall Street. Yeah. And one day I pondered to myself, what if I utilize what I learned in school into the real world, meaning go out there and really buy stocks, right? Mm -hmm. So that thought actually... Uh, consume me for a few days and I had the courage I approached my mom say mom can I borrow your brokerage account <laughs> <laughs> but of course I, I put in a bit of my money as well yeah. um, the first stock I bought was Hub Steel okay. um, I bought it based on the net asset value it had a hidden uh, asset in Tai Seng which the value was much higher than what was recorded in the balance sheet mm -hmm. and made some money over there about $400 and from there on you know it's really seeing it's believing and since then I actually have spent almost all my army pays in, into buying investment books. I was hanging around uh, value investing, uh, valuebuddies.com, got a lot of insights from there. Um, and I really saw how investing could actually improve the quality of my life. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently, um, I got kind of, I, I joined an investment firm um, to manage uh, a portion of their funds. Um, I had a great time there, a lot of stretching. I think uh, my mentor was, uh, how I often say is uh, sometimes um, harsh and sometimes demanding and often unreasonable. Yeah. But I think he did that because he had this end goal in mind is to really stretch us. And um, from then on, I actually um, got exposed to a lot of Japanese companies, a lot of right. Australian companies. We had a lot of conference calls with them. 
And, you know, since then, you know, this has always been my passion. I've been intrigued with uh, business models. I've been intrigued about how, if you look at these two businesses, why would one business be better than the other business, right? Why would a business have a higher, higher uh, return on equity? So these are questions that always consume my mind. And I think um, just felt really blessed and lucky that along this journey, I've met a lot of incredible mentors. Right. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. So you almost... Uh... Uh, have ne- never really have a career change and you just got started since your university days in investing um so actually i i took a i took a big leap of faith right ah, so right. right after army i had a government scholarship i had right. a ntu placement wow. uh, you know finally right Whoa, okay uh but when the chance came to join an uh, investment firm i actually uh, gave all of that up, wow. uh, which is a <laughs> dangerous thing to do, I wow, would say. Okay. But I, I felt I felt like in my heart, mm. like tr- if I look back in my life, I think a lot of times it's following my heart. I think a lot of people yeah. um, kind of knew what was right for, for myself. So I, I just went ahead with that. Wow, that's, that's definitely very brave of you. Wow, very, so, so <laughs> very respect. Of, of today, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a degree. A lot yeah. of things is self-taught and right. really constantly reading books and meeting people to learn from them as well. Yeah, I think that's actually more important uh, to, to, have, to really experience life and, and learn from life itself, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I didn't know that about uh, your history. <laughs> oh. Okay, so, uh, sounds good. And I think today you have, uh, you're going to introduce us one company that is also... Uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with uh, okay. both in the industry and also this company. I haven't really uh, studied much into it, sure. and, but I find it fascinating uh, reading through your your thought process. Uh, why don't you share this company with with our audience? So hey guys, uh, Calvin here today. I'm going to present to you a case study called Himake. So what's Himake all about, right? I, I want to share with you the history about Himake. Himake uh, used to be a blood bank, meaning um, they collect blood and they sell the blood away uh, to maybe companies that uses blood as a starting material to do their R&D. So for example, to solve, to solve cancer, to solve leukemia, you actually, when you do your R&D process, you actually require blood, you know, as your starting material. And for them, they have been supplying very high quality um, blood to uh, companies like Novartis for their research development process. And um, they are actually supporting two of the FDA approved uh, CAR-T treatments. So for the CAR-T treatments, I'll talk about it uh, later on. Mm-hmm. So I just want to share with you some quick stats about the company. Um, generally, for my invest- investment style, I actually prefer smaller companies. That has always been my age because I, I do feel that in the world, let's say we look at the bigger companies, a lot of times, um, I, I, mean, I mean, there are a lot of smarter people than me. They probably can analyze Facebook, Google, Amazon a lot better than me. But for me, my main focus is really micro caps. And that has been where I was. I am focusing on for the past two years. So um, T-Mark has actually listed on the OTC board. So in US, you have your NASDAQ, you have your New York, um, you have your uh, 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 NYS, American uh, Stock Exchange. But for T-Mark is particularly listed on OTC. And I think on the first glance, if you look at companies that are listed on the OTC board, you would generally feel that um, they are risky, right? Because pink sheets, penny stocks, that kind of stuff. But surprisingly, I managed to find Himakia, which is a very high quality business. Mm-hmm. So at around $19.90, the share price, um, it has a market cap of about $300 million fully diluted. I think for the last three years, if you look at the revenue growth, they have been growing at 40%, operating margin about 22%. The ROE is about uh, 29%, uh, rounded up. Uh, the net debt over equity is about negative 30%. So 30% of their shareholders' equity is purely in cash. Uh-huh. Um, some of the clients, uh, which I'll talk about it later on, is Novartis, uh, Sancor, who are really strong clients. So I actually prefer companies we have very strong clients because they have the ability to pay up. I, I do come across some companies in the past whereby, um, you know, you, you could be doing business for that client and you know, the client go bust or the client wouldn't pay yeah. up the money. And then you have this whole chunk of trade receivables, which is um, not really uh, something to be happy about. All right. So I, I tend to look at uh, companies with very strong um, clients. Right. So if you look at it in the in the last two years, I think the share price have done tremendously well. Um, but today, I think it's my job to share with you why I think this industry or, or rather this company is interesting despite the huge run up in the share price. Right. So before that, I just want to talk a bit more about the industry. I think, um, sadly, I think human, we are not 
robots, right? So sometimes we do fall sick, we have a lot of mm-hmm. issues with our body. And one of the biggest problem is actually cancer, right? Cancer mm-hmm. kills a lot of people and, and, and it's just a sad thing. So one, one of the most common treatment procedure is really chemotherapy, right? Mm-hmm. So I actually asked some of my doctors what's chemotherapy, right? Because I kind of understand it, but I don't understand it fully. Yeah. So how, how it works is really, um, they'll put you into operating theater and they'll put some pipes into your body and they'll, and they'll make sure the, the, I mean, the room is airtight. They'll close the door, everything else, and then they'll pump certain gas in your body. And, and the gas is uh, really killing almost most of the cells, right? And sometimes even the good cells will die. And that's why uh, your immune system actually goes down because it kills white blood cells. And because of that, you know, after the chemotherapy, people often feel uh, fall sick. The hair will drop out because the immune system is just not strong enough. And that has always been the procedure to cure cancer, but it's not a really good procedure because you think about it. If let's say in your room, you have a cockroach, you wouldn't, spray your whole room with uh, you know cockroach killing gas right you if, if you have a, a way to target to kill that cockroach maybe putting out a, a cockroach trap you know it, it's, it's actually much more better because it doesn't affect the whole room yeah. so in this in this scenario I'm, I'm just thinking about um, CAR-T treatment which I'll talk about it so um, so in a Currently, right now around the world, um, there's a lot of financing, a lot of money that goes into CAR-T treatment. So what does it mean? You know, if you if, if we draw 100 milliliters of blood, right, we have plasma, we have white, white blood cells, and we have the red blood cells. But really, what is the one that cures you from your fever, from the problems that you have in your body? Uh, your white blood cells, right? So white blood cells, are it's, it's kind of like the petrol, right? They yeah. petrol around your body. They look for any virus or any, any bacteria cells that feels foreign to them mm-hmm. and they will latch themselves onto the bacteria and consume it and pass it out as waste, right? right okay. But uh, unfortunately, if you look at cancer cells, they are really smart people. You know, they can camouflage themselves and they look as if they're healthy cells. So when the white, white blood cells circulate around your body, they, they couldn't find, right. you know, they couldn't recognize and identify uh, the bacteria cells. So. Mm-hmm. When we talk when we talk about CAR T treatment, right? Because there's this word called immunotherapy. Because in our body, we already have what it takes to cure our own own cancer, whatever it is, right? But we need to enhance the capabilities of the white blood cells, right? So if you see this chart on I think slide number six, mm-hmm. what 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 does it mean? It means that they are actually extracting blood from a patient and and take out the white blood cells and then enhance the white blood cells. Uh, using a certain receptors. So they actually enhance the strength, the, the abilities of the white blood cells, and then they will inject back into the body. And the white blood cells will actually move around the body and start having this ability to identify the bacteria and the cancer cells and destroy it. So uh, a CAR-T treatment is probably costing half a million dollars. Uh, it's, it's very expensive. Um, so the part is that uh, Himacare is not doing this procedure, but what Himacare is doing is supplying blood to uh, these big players like Novartis to assist them in the R&D process Mm -hmm. so that they can create CAR-T treatments. Right. Yeah. Okay. So just want to move on to slide number seven. So this Mm -hmm. is where, um, I I think just to keep it really simple, it's just like today, you know, just imagine I'm a white blood cells, right? Mm. And I walk around the room, I do not know who is cancerous cells, who are the healthy cells, but going, being, after being enhanced, it seems like as if I have this extra pair of glasses that allows me to identify the cancerous cells. And once I identify them, I'm able to destroy them. And I can, and, and as a result, the human body will get, you know, cured of cancer. So just think about CAR T treatment as something of enhancing the abilities of white blood cells. And this is really important to share because, um, you know, like big companies like Novartis, they are spending millions or sometimes billions of dollars trying to research a better cure for cancer. I mean, um, election is next year for US and Joe Biden actually ran his campaign with uh, this campaign promise of curing cancer. So really cancer is one of the biggest things which I find it uh, quite amusing, but I also recognize the importance of it. But uh, maybe just to clarify a little bit, uh, you say that um, they for the CAR-T treatment and uh, everything, but he he don't really do the research. Right? They're just supplying the blood, is Correct. that right? And right. if they're just supplying the blood, 
it, does it matter where they get the blood, either from Himacare or from another provider? Okay, sure. Um, okay, the reason why I actually like this company a lot, because if you look at back then uh, in US, I just bring across this example of the gold mine, right? So um, instead of being the gold miner yourself mm. and sometimes digging gold and sometimes you don't even get gold, right? Why don't you be the shovel? Right, right, seller. Mm -hmm. You sell shovels to the gold miners. Mm -hmm. So of course there are a lot of players that's in this very hotly, a uh, hotly contested industry. Um, so Hima Care um, actually provides a shovel, and from that point, I feel that the risk profile of the company is very different from those pharma companies. Right. And again, later on I will share a chart whereby, um, when it comes to drug development process, you know there's three phases, right? Phase one, phase two, phase three. Mm -hmm. As you passes from phase one to phase two to phase three it gets more stringent mm -hmm. and when it gets more stringent it means you need a higher sample size so when you need a higher sample size um, um, if you currently are working on with a certain supplier mm -hmm. if they can't supply you that kind of blood then you know your r d process stops but also when we talk about blood suppliers there are actually two kinds of blood supplies one kind of blood supplies will only supply you blood that are certified research use only mm -hmm. it means you can you can use it on phase one phase two probably so mm -hmm. but there's another kind of blood supply which is uh gmp which is good manufacturing practices it means um you can use their blood all right to go to commercialization mm -hmm. so we do see in a lot of cases whereby all these big players they would try to use a uh, research use only uh suppliers mm -hmm. but then subsequently they say you know um FDA actually require us to have a higher standard and they will eventually, almost all of them would go back to Himakia and say, Himakia, can you supply the blood to me? Because they are the only one that, I think mean, one of the very few, like less than five, is a GMP uh, compliant. Right. And it's really all these regulations. Because at the end of the day, um, when it comes to blood type, right, it's really dealing with human lives. Mm -hmm. And you don't really want to screw these things up, you know, and if one of your drug kills one or two person, mm. that that R&D project will be cute and I think the reputation damage is really uh, quite enormous. Yeah. So even though Himacare sells its product for a premium, mm -hmm. rightly so, uh, but it assures the guarantee of uh, a good R&D process and it should expedite uh, the approval process for some of the clients as well. Mm, wow, okay, fascinating. Um, I think also the most important thing is, is this, right? Himacare has been a blood bank for the last 30 years, meaning it has a lot of reputation, a lot of database with a lot of uh, donors as well. And all the donors are pretty much educated that they are donating, donating blood for a cause. Mm. So um, just give you an example. So sometimes Novartis will, will come to Himakeh and say, hey Himakeh, I need a blood. I need a blood from maybe a lady that's 70 years old. Mm. And I also need uh, her to have previously a cancer but cured. Or maybe I, I want a guy that is a, a, a American um, but I only want him to be below 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's all these complex, customized requirements which makes it really hard for other uh, competitors to compete with them or rather other competitors to supply the blood quantity to, to Himakeh because Himakeh's history was the blood bank for the last 30 to 40 years, which is why they have this vast amount of database they can tap on. Because you think about it, if I'm going through a R and D process, phase one, phase two, phase three, I cannot just run my uh, 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 drug on just pure Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna test on a wide range of human beings, uh, old, right. young, fat, skinny, different races. So to, to have that kind of requirement and to able to supply that amount of complex variety of blood types from different races, I think it's not difficult. I think it's uh, quite hard. Mm -hmm. And I think Himakeh, because of has the history of being a blood bank for so many years, um, he has the ability to supply that blood. And not only that, I think um, when you come to do an RD project, there's a lot of variables in place. So when you do your diagnosis, to uh, understand what went wrong, what went right, sometimes you have this requirement of having a, uh, 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 you want to do a test again, right? Mm -hmm. So they go to Himaki and say, hey, I want this guy that's above 70 years old. Uh, but for most competitors, they can't because people would only want to donate once because they're not well educated by the blood donors. But in this case, Himaki could go back to the guy and mm -hmm. say that, hey, you know, we need your blood again. Mm. Is it possible that you come back and donate your blood again? And, you know, I heard of some cases whereby people would actually take a day off, okay, <laughs> okay. To, to, just, to just donate donate blood again. So because they are they're educated and, and the process where they actually teach people about, hey, you're donating blood for whatever reason, I think that, that brings across a competitive age uh, 
uh, for them as well. Right. So I just want to talk about uh, slide number 13. Mm -hmm. So I think Himacare, I've done some research with their competitors like uh, Stem Express, Stem Cell uh, Technologies. Himacare have one of the widest range of uh, disease uh, state blood. So you want uh, bone marrow, you want uh, people from different uh, uh, races, they have everything that they need. And uh, although I think uh, Bio IVT is one of Himascare's largest competitor, but they seem to be um, undercutting on, on pricing. So I'm not sure whether um, that works out very well, but I think for the first half this year, Himascare has still reported almost like 40% growth in, 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 in uh, earnings. And I think um, I would like to share one story which I had, you know, uh, listened from um, Pete, who is the CEO. Mm -hmm. He often, you know, when he was, when Himacare was largely unknown by all these big pharma companies, what, what, what he did was that, you know, he saw that the pharma company was trying to figure out how um, to go about their R&D project. And Pete said that, you know, you guys are doing certain things wrong in, in the research right, process. This is why you have been stuck there for almost two years. And, you know, those big players will say, you know, Pete, your company is a small company. You know, what do you know? Right. So Pete just left, you know, and, 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 but Pete, you know, again, two years later, went back and, and tried to assist. Right. Mm. And this time around, uh, the bigger companies, you know, they're spending so much millions of dollars trying to figure out a solution and it could not work. Right. So this time around, I say, okay, Pete, tell us what should we do? And within less than, I think, a year, the whole blockage was being solved because Himacare was able to provide the right blood type to assist them in their development process. Mm -hmm. And from that on, from that incident onwards, actually the reputation of Himacare have started to spread around as well. Right. And also most often, I think is all their salesperson, right, are all PhD. You know, oh. they all have PhD. They speak to the uh, pharma companies and tell them, you know, because sometimes when a scientist has certain requirements and you speak to someone that's selling blood but knows nothing about blood, I think it's, it's very tough. Mm. But when the salesperson have a PhD, they take on the same, they talk about the same wavelength, and the sales process is actually much more easier right. uh, from from there. Okay. All right. All right. So we talk about uh, slide number fourteen. So I think um, this year they actually managed to move into the new facility, and that actually doubled its uh, donor collection capacity and uh, on-site processing capabilities as well. So right now, um, according to the management, it's about twenty-five uh, percent utilized. So um, the reason why they had to expand so quickly because I think there are a lot more clients that's coming on board. I think they could have this visibility of the demand uh, are coming on as well. And I think if I look at slide 15, uh, Himacare, when they reported their first half results on uh, 20 August, they actually uh, list an additional space uh, to accommodate a GMP project management. So I, I found it very interesting because they have just doubled their capacity and now they list an additional space as well. So that could actually, I mean, it's not, I could actually kind of like infer that a lot of demand is, is coming through and they have to get prepared for it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll move on to the next um, um, top, uh, segment, which is actually the growth drivers here. So uh, this is one of the product from Novartis called Crimea. Uh, uh, Crimea. Mm -hmm. So this is actually their forecast that they have, have actually shared. Um, I think if I look at the recent results from Novartis, uh, it actually is growing very well. So CAR T treatment, I think is, is, a, is a very niche kind of cancer treatment that's been growing rapidly around the world. People who want to extend their life and, you know, I could be trying all sorts of treatments, but if all don't work and I still think that my life is precious, I'm still young. If I'm, you know, if, you know, today if I'm rich, I'll just spend half a million uh, to kind of like extend the life uh, span of, of me, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, this has actually uh, been something quite useful because um, if you can see Novartis sales growth has been uh, uh, growing that also shows Himacare um, would possibly grow along with them as well. Um, Kite Pharma, which is another uh, FDA approved uh, CAR T treatment as well, has also uh, has been also been growing. Um, so if you look at the customer base, I think it's really a very re reputable uh, clients that uh, are, are. You know the way I think about it is very simple. Like today, if I if I, I if I source my blood type from a supplier that probably um, is not well known, mm. right? Or probably is, is, is new to the industry. I could pay them uh, maybe for the blood type, let's say one, one uh, let's say what, uh, uh, 30 kg of blood, right? Uh, much more cheaper than Himacare. But that doesn't guarantee that, you know, the blood, okay. 
So I just want to give a, a context a bit. So I, I know it's a bit technical, but uh, I, I try my best to simplify it. Mm -hmm. Usually, let's say when we draw our blood to a, 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 a certain area, we have to actually freeze it because blood, the primary cells will actually die off very quickly. So if today I purchase it from another supplier, mm -hmm. and the moment the blood reaches to my facility and, and the primary cells dies, let's say 20% of it dies, and for me to do my R&D project, it will actually create a lot of complication. So if my R&D project costs about like a million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar, why would I want to jeopardize it by buying from an unproven player? Mm. Why don't I buy it from Team Care, which um, have proven that, you know, I can buy like uh, 30 kg of blood, right? Mm. When the premise cells arrive, it's good condition, it's pristine. And in the industry term, we will call it healthy cells. Mm. So the cells are still healthy, it's still alive, and I can actually conduct my R&D uh, uh, projects on it. So that's one of the uh, unique point about uh, Hima, Hima care as well. And I just want to share with you, uh, a lot of times when uh, doing my uh, process, I actually look at what the customer feel about the business. So uh, these are some comments from Novartis, from uh, Zencore, this is uh, site 19 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Novartis said, I never felt like I was on a sales call. Mm -hmm. Discussions were very science driven and together we stepped on a new exciting territory. I had a chance to work with some of the uh, a lot of vendors, but you certainly stand out for the terms of uh, stand out for me in terms of dedication, flexibility, and quality as well. Um, yeah, so I, I go to on page twenty. So Himacare currently provides starting material for three of the approved cellular therapies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's quite exciting. Um, okay, then I, I move on to page uh, um, slide twenty two. So this is a whole list of um, I would say. Uh, qualifications that they have i think to replicate that process um, it's not easy so i feel that you know if, if you look at how the regulation is is, is around this industry is actually very very tight for example uh, let's talk about a gmp qualification how do you even be gmp compliant all right uh, for example you really have to have a lot of audits like who do you donate blood from do you have the consent and who does the processing I want the person's name down. Who, who operates the machine to separate the white blood cells from the plasma? I want the person to be trained. The person has to be trained consistently to be updated. You know, a lot of paperwork, documentation has to be there because we are dealing with human lives here. We are dealing with a, with a product that eventually goes into a human's body. So um, the FDA of, um, of US is actually very, very particular. That's why not many people actually have the GMP compliant uh, 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 qualification. Sometimes it's not just having money. You know, if today I have 100 million, I tell myself, I want to build an organization. I want to supply blood as GMP compliant. I don't think it's just simple as that. I think it requires industry knowledge. I think it uh, requires a culture along around it that helps, helps to get this uh, process. And the process could also take a long time as well. Hmm. Okay. Um, maybe I just sorry I just break you down uh, break down a little bit um, for when you talk about because they have very high quality bloods that they supply to to all these customers and uh, tagging on to the growth of uh, the CAR T treatment um, do they break down like who like how many percent of that blood is going to uh, which R&D or uh, how, how do you actually know that they are actually benefiting from this growth in uh, research into CAR-T treatment. Okay, so for this one, is um, I already off the website that they actually are serving certain clients. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the customer breakdown, I actually do not have the customer breakdown. I think they are being quite secretive around it. Mm -hmm, uh, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so I don't actually have that information uh, on, on the business itself. Mm -hmm. okay. But I, I, I think this business, um, it's, it's quite exciting. So later on, um, I think there's a segment which I talk about the uh, industry as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. okay. So uh, on slide 23, you can actually see the Himacare uh, recallable donor base. So really, I think it's quite amazing that people will actually take days off just to ensure that, um, you know, Himacare has the right product to be able to sell to all these uh, Novartis um, uh, players like that as well. Do they pay their donors? No? Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, the, the, the exciting thing is this, like as I was reading this industry, I, I discovered that US is the only country that pays people for their blood. You know, in Singapore, you know, we get Milo, they get skin and, you know, that's all right. Yeah, yeah so uh, US is uh, known as uh, one of the greatest exporter of uh, plasma blood. Right. 
uh, white blood cells as well. Um, in fact, I was speaking to uh, a director, supply chain director from Tesla Therapeutic. In Singapore, although we have the nat uh, National Blood uh, uh, Center as well, but I think we often lack enough, enough blood for us to even um, have the right quantity to do our R&D. Like for example, we want to embark on this R&D project and ask ourselves how many tests do we need to do? What's the quantity of blood do we need to have? A lot of times um, it's just not possible because you know, like we donate blood, mm. it's really a voluntary thing and there's not a lot of drive to it. Yeah. But in, in US, I think donating blood is uh, something quite regular. Mm. And I would say this is quite sad because in America, um, um, you know, we are always brainwashed how prosperous America is, but America, there are a lot of poor people that, mm. that, that at least on pay paycheck to paycheck. And mm. There are a lot of poor uh, Americans that actually donate blood and receive a $45 so that they can buy a birthday cake for their right. kids as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's a good side and a bad side. Uh, the bad side is that, you know, poor people are actually donating their blood. So, but then the good is that you have all this blood supply that can actually aid in advancing human um, human research, uh, advancing discoveries in, in human uh, immunotherapy as well. Hmm. Okay, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So really, I think uh, the ability is to provide um, I think high priority, high yield uh, products as well. So um, that kind of shows, I mean, on, on slide 24 is that um, as the days goes by, uh, the blood the blood uh, cells actually <laughs> die fairly quickly, mm. so uh, it's it's not something that's um, easy because um, it's really high requirement. And then on slide twenty five, you could actually see um, this clinical development phase one, two, and three. But if you really have a, a solid uh, starting material, which is your 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 blood, and that actually have if let's say you have promising outcomes, you actually are able to expedite the process because you know sometimes why why is CAR T treatment so expensive why is it like 400k 500k because if you think if, you, if I, I did not understand that you know I thought that you know you're ripping off customers here and there but if you think about a pharma perspective is that they could be running four five six R&D projects and probably five of them could just die out you know just because certain things do not work mm. and every day where if every day where we are on uh, R&D uh, 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 uh. Okay, I would say that if every every single day that we spend on, on R and D, it could cost another million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar. Mm -hmm. So if you are able to expedite that process and go to market, that means have a commercialized product that's ready to go to the market, it actually saves them a lot of money. Which is why out of everything, the starting material is actually one of the most essential one. And I think if let's say your, your project costs about you know, uh, per day costs about $1 million and the blood is just like 50K, 60K. Yeah. If you pay that 5% more, 10% more to, to ensure to have the guarantee, I think uh, generally it's like almost quite brainless to just pay up to, yeah. to ensure that, that, that the stability of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I talk about slide number 27. You can actually see that most of the staff are science-oriented degrees, a PhD as well. Um, but Again, I think there's a downside here because uh, people like that um, are not easy to hire. The knowledge, the ability is not easy to, to hire as well. So um, eventually, if they want to scale to sell to more people, um, to train the staff, I think it will require some time. It's not someone where you can just hire and within two to three months, you know, that, that guy could actually go out and sell confidently. Mm. It's something that requires a lot of uh, deep domain uh, expertise. It's a good thing and a bad thing from the way I, I look at it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, just moving on a bit about the industry, right? Um, I think gene and cell therapy is, is starting to grow. I've uh, been speaking to more, more uh, uh, friends from, uh, from the hospital. Um, I think really um, um, this is an industry that would see more growth. And I actually went on to this website called Alliance for uh, Regenerative Medicine here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really to show the global financing, the amount of money that have gone into gene and cell therapy. So you could see that it's about in, in billions of dollars as well. Um, I think that's, that's kind of a sign of how people are interested into growing that industry and finding uh, a suitable CAR T treatment as well. And I think that um, is good uh, for Himalcare because it means that the demand is there, the tailwind is there. People are probably going to demand more uh, blood samples from them as well, but I think blood is not a. It's not something that you can just produce out of a, a, a factory, right? Mm. Like there's regulations about how we can donate blood. I think in a, I think 
I think in a month, we in US, I think probably donate about three to four times. You just can't donate blood all the time. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the recruitment process, I think uh, Hima has to, I mean, every day, I mean, they have just two person that they do nothing every day, but just focus on a recruitment um, for, for the blood uh, oh. as well. So again, I think when we talk about scalability as well, um, it's no use if there's demand, but you can't supply the blood. So I think the management recognized that portion as well. And blood is something that you cannot just manufacture like that. Yeah. It, it comes from a willingness of your donor base to, to donate blood as well. Yeah. So I think that, I think something we have to be aware about the business. Like not everything is like sunshine. So there's some downsides uh, to the business as well. Yeah. So uh, to, to, to better understand this, this, this part of their collection and, and supply, uh, uh, do they need to be collecting the blood very close to the R and D center of their client because blood cannot be stored for too long, like you said. So, uh, is there a logistical issue, uh, mm. for for them to scale up? Okay, so for this one, right, currently the uh, current facilities is uh is is joined with their processing facility. Mm -hmm. So the moment the blood is being extracted, it goes to the processor. You 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 extract the different components of the blood, white blood cells, red blood cells, plasma, mm -hmm. and then uh, it gets freezed. So there's this company called BioLife, mm -hmm. which is very well known uh, in US for their, uh, their system called chiro preservation. So they freeze the blood in a certain method that actually retains the purity, the, the high yield, the, the, the lives of the blood cells. So this part they are not strong at, but they outsource to this player called BioLife. So they have a strategic alliances with BioLife to, 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 to actually uh, perform that role right. of the business. And after they freeze it, they can, it can be used for a long time or how does it work? Usually the moment they freeze it, then, you know, uh, you, there's a method to, 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 to turn it back to the liquid form. And usually one day or I, I would say just one day and you have to use the material already. So it's like high, highly perishable uh, right. material. But as long as you freeze it, you still can store it. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, correct. Mm. Correct. Okay. So the freezing, um, I've yet to understand fully. Mm. <laughs> you know, I, I, I definitely know that it's not just putting the freezer. <laughs> it's like some... our frozen meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, some, there's some method behind it. Yeah. I'm just trying to okay. uh, figure it out as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, so... <laughs> All right. So slide 30, right? Um, uh, clinical trials have also uh, increased uh, rapidly as well. You look from uh, 2009 to 2017, the ongoing trials, the newly started trials, they have all been uh, increasing as well. So that clearly shows the demand for the product as well. And um, on site 31st, uh, uh, they actually have this act that's being passed in the, uh, in the, in the Senate. Um, it's called the 21st Century Kiosk Act. So um, this act is targeted to immunotherapy research. So they are uh, supplying funding to the National Institutions of Health to a tune about uh, $1.8 billion per year. So even the government like US, I mean, I, I think of it like the, the race to the moon, right? In the past Soviet Union, uh, US, uh, China, they're talking about who is able to touch, you know, uh, put a guy on the moon first. And I think US managed to do did that well. And I think around the world, uh, China, US, they are the, uh, I think they are, they are leading in, in this space. And I think US doesn't want to rest on its laurels. They are really serious about having this immunotherapy up and ready for its cancer. Because the, the way I look at it is that if you have a drug that could cure cancer, you literally could dominate. And, and I think it's a sense of national pride as well. So they're putting a lot of money and to ensure that it, it kind of works uh, for them as well. Uh, for the management, I just talk about uh, Pete Vanderwall uh, is actually as chief executive officer, not really a, not really a founder, but he was uh, appointed as the CEO since 2010, and he saw that they were just doing really ordinary business like getting blood, you know, and, and selling blood, you know, just being being a middleman, and he saw that you know a much more profitable business is learning how to process the blood, customize the blood type to supply it to all these big players as well. And when they went there, you know, the culture was really bad. Um, there were a lot of, I think, politics. But what he described to me is that an organization is like a like an onion, right? Uh, you have to let go of the bad people. So it's like onion, you, you peel, you peel and peel. And, and what he realized is that the core of the organization is actually a very strong team of people. 
So he spent, a, I think, a few months to really get the culture back together. And he said something which actually uh, made me think a lot. He said, my job is to make myself redundant. Hmm. <laughs> I thought that was a bit funny because, but then I, on the second time, I, I understand one thing because when the CEO is redundant, it means that the team is strong. Hmm. So he is here to build a, a, a strong team. And he realized that a lot of good people in the organization, they literally had their handcuffs. You know, it means that it's a lot of red tapes that goes around the organization. And sometimes you have ideas, but I cannot pull through because you have a lot of just red tapes, right? Mm-hmm. So when he went there, he, he took off all the handcuffs and really let people excel. He let people run, let people take ownership. And I think the whole organization runs as a decentralized organization. Mm-hmm. And only when uh, important decisions have to be made and Pete steps in to kind of uh, work things out. And Pete spends a lot of time speaking to customers and ensuring that the relationship remains strong and understand and ensuring that I think customers' requirements are, are being met. So they are a very customer-driven uh, organization, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, he marketed as they are very strategic. They invited a lot of key personnel from the industry to sit on the boards of directors. So sometimes I look at board of directors uh, very carefully who are on the board. Um, so for example, this lady called Dr. Jill, uh, she's the director of the Cancer Research Institution, mm-hmm. very well known, uh, a thought leader. So I guess when Dr. Jill goes to uh, industry conferences, who, who also promote Himacare quite a bit. But there, there are some scenarios whereby I look at uh, certain businesses and I wonder why are there like army generals, mm. why are there uh, people that are not related to the industry being there. So. I think a board of directors is actually very important to actually guide the CEO, uh, guide the management team on what are the latest industry trends and also offer insights as well. And I, and I do realize that uh, over time, very successful companies, they are actually staffed with very good uh, uh, independent directors as well. Okay, so I just want to talk about uh, slide 35. Um, I think the risk here for the business is, uh, is you know, like my preference has always been platform business, right? So mm. just for example, like Visa, mm. uh, for them to uh, 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 share the technology with uh, additional 100 or 600 uh, uh, merchants, it's actually not them doing the job, it's actually the Ingenico, right? Which is the payment terminal, or, or first data, the permanent, the payment terminal company. Mm. And, you know, any transaction, I, you know, you can swipe a $50, $100, $1,000, $1,000,000, $1, whatever it is, right? Visa gets to triple as a card. Very scalable business, you know, very, very good business as well. But in this case, uh, it's unique, right? Like, I, I, I tend not to buy into manufacturing businesses, but in this case, is 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 you know, I ask myself, Himacare is doing something unique. But again, I see the problem here is that um, as they outgrow their facility, yep. do they have to spend the capex to grow the business? You know, so capex is something that I think um, it's like growth capex, right? Kind of grow the, the business, but uh, the tendency is like I like to see businesses that don't have a lot of capex and you generate a lot, a lot of free cash flow mm-hmm. and I think that's actually a better way to grow the business so I often ask myself is that this facility allow them to, to, to double their output and you know they have been leasing another facility and but right now you know um, if they continue to grow what's the amount of capex that's being required but I think in this case it's not so bad because the capex that's being spent I think there are a lot of demand that's already being placed um, for them to be well utilized. Um, you know, I, I never like a scenario whereby you spend your money to have a facility and then you incur depreciation on it, but mm-hmm. only like 10% of it is being utilized. I think it's like a waste of money. But right. in this case, I think it's it's not too bad, but it's just something at the back of my mind as well. Cool. Yeah. So on, on slide 36, uh, it's just really rehashing about the proper documentation, the SOPs, uh, the training. Um, it's not really something that, um, it's not easy to achieve. Now slide 37, um, actually, if I, if I look at the product inventories and supplies, right? So as of 2018, they had about 3.6, sorry, they have about 4.2 million of worth of uh, product inventories, mm-hmm. but out of which they have about close to 900K of uh, obsolescence. Mm. So <laughs> the blood just died off and yep. you know, you, you, you pay money and <laughs> then the blood dies, dies off and you can't use it. You can't, you know, pass it on to your, to your customers. and. Mm. I don't think that's a good thing here. Uh, it's still a high 21.2% uh, obsolescence thing. Um, I think they are trying their best to make sure that the blood type is, is of high quality. But again, uh, what I would like to mention here is uh, a, a unique scenario. Let's say if they were to improve on their obs- 
on their uh, inventory write off amount, um, the profits will actually go up because this obsolescence is being wrote off on the PL level. So, but if you know, if they could actually manage their portion a bit better, the profit margins would go up, the profits would, would actually go up as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, so, I mean, this is just something if I think they could manage better, it would um, definitely help them as well. Um, in terms of the numbers itself, um, I'm, I'm, uh, typically in my valuation method, I, I, I prefer to use uh, enterprise value to operating profit. Mm-hmm. So just going to share uh, briefly, if you look at the revenue f- all the way from 2015, all the way to 2019, um, it's about 40% growth rate for quite a number of years. Mm. Um, in fact, although they started off a low base, so you could say uh, 40% is uh, exaggerated, but it seemed to show that they are able to continue growing at that kind of rate for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, if you look at the gross uh, profit uh, 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 margins as well, I think it was 45% in 2015, but have grown to about 55% on 2018. Mm-hmm. So it does seem that they are able to manage the cost well and they are becoming more profitable on that level. Um, as of the operating income, you could see that 2015 they were negative, about $1.4 million negative. Mm-hmm. But since then they have grown really stronger because I guess the reputation is being built. I think the customers are recognizing the value that they are providing as well. Um, I think the, the margins are about 22% uh, currently. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe I have a question on the financial for you first. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that this company has been around for 40 years, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, it seems that they have some restructuring back in 2011 and 2012. Um, do, do you want to share a little bit what, what happened then uh, and uh, what, what has uh, actually changed after that, that period? Besides okay. the new CEO who came in. Okay, so that business has been, uh, been around for a long time, but I don't think it's being managed by a driven, a visionary CEO. In fact, they're just doing the same old boring stuff for a long time to come. Yeah. Uh, but like when, when, when Pete, the CEO, came on board, um, he saw that there were actually two parts to the business. One is doing the commoditized blood collection, uh, like a blood reseller mm-hmm. kind of business, which uh, itself, I don't think it, 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 it creates any value at all. Uh, but the other side of business, which is where they are really strong in, is actually processing the blood as well. And which is why uh, over time, I think they actually sold, uh, sold that, that, that reseller business component away and they were solely focusing on growing that niche but extremely profitable business side. Um, if you look on 20, 2015, the reason why they were unprofitable is that um, they kind of understood one thing that the business is bound to grow. Mm. And which is why that year alone, they actually hired a lot of executives um, it, it actually added a lot of cost to the business. However, you know, I think the management, because being on OTC, you don't have a lot of Wall Street pressure. Mm. It, I mean, in, in, I, mean I, I like businesses that have the capacity to suffer, meaning you know that you are doing the right thing for the business, although on the PNL level, it will show negative earnings. So on that year alone, I think they hired a lot of people to, to ensure that they have the right staff to support their clients and that push the whole business to negative territory. Mm. But you, you know, like as an investor, if I look at it, you're like, oh shit, this company's loss making is it's dangerous, blah, 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 here and there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, when I spoke to the management, they said that they knew that that year they're going to be loss making, but they still press ahead with hiring more people because that may not be uh, popular with the short term objective, which is, which is showing profitability, but that certainly put us in the long run, in the long term to show a sustainable and growing business. And I think it was proven right because since 2015 all the way to 2018, you can see that after the hiring was pretty much done, the mm. key personnel was being put in place, the operating income actually started to shoot up as well. Mm. And I think uh, 2019, it should demonstrate uh, similar trends as well, just judging by the first half of the, of the, of the 2019 results. All right, so on the financials, um, actually I, I had a call with the CEO, uh, Pete, uh, we, we had a, one hour call because fascinating business, not a lot of insights that could be gleaned from uh, the internet. So what he shared was that how he's seeing a lot of demand in the business as well. And then he said that within two years time frame, uh, it will be uh, quite possible that it hit $19 in revenue. So just to give context on that, uh, 2019, they were having a 40 million in, in revenue, but 
I think in 2021, they should hit $90 million in revenue. And that, could, that also gels up with what we are seeing earlier is that they expanded their, 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 their facility and they, on top of that, they list the additional facility that's adjacent to it for the GN, GMP uh, project as well. So usually when I look at management, I want to hear what they have to say. I want to understand whether it gels up together. I think that's uh, something very important. Um, I'm going to use a, a, a price comparable method, but um, I'll, I'll talk about the, the valuations first. So I guess they are probably going to hit about $90 million in, in two years time. And um, um, I talk about a bit about, okay, so I, I guess I did not add it in the slide, but there's one point that I, I like to mention because for example, if Himacare have actually processed the blood type, but again, we are very aware that um, there is this, uh, it's highly perishable. So usually, let's say when we were to do a, 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 a CAR-T treatment, you know, the procedure is about 50 steps, right? 50 steps, a long process. But can Novartis say, you know, the first five steps, can I outsource to Himacare? Because that is the most critical part. For example, uh, 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 getting the blood, processing the blood, and you do additional five steps. That means you're like outsource manufacturer for me for the product. So Himacare said, sure, why not, right? But Himacare did not have the experience in that, right? But what Himacare has is the clean rooms, have the machines, have the equipment, and have the people as well. So, uh, for example, using the same amount of people, all right, they're not going to hire more people, but using the same amount of people, they are going to earn more revenue. So what do I mean by that? Because Himacare doesn't have the experience, but Novartis is going to teach them. So when Novartis teach them, who gets paid? Himacare gets paid. They get paid for learning. And when they write a new SOP, they will build... It's called a billable event. So they build uh, X amount of money and using the machine, using their people, it's, it's going to be another billable event. So several, five billable events using the same people. So your, your incremental cost is almost zero, but your revenue is higher. So your, your, your margins will actually go up over time. But in this case, I'm just going to use a conservative uh, operating margin of about 20%. So nine, 90 million uh, in revenue in two years, 20% operating profit margin. It give you a price market of 25 times. Uh, I, I don't think it's aggressive because if you look at comparables, you look at how uh, this industry would actually uh, pan out. I think 25 times multiple is kind of like a fair valuation. Um, so this is the enterprise value of 450, 450 million enterprise value. But if you work backwards to find an equity value, uh, you add back the cash of 8.1 million, which is currently on the balance sheet, you have about 458.1 million equity value divided by the shares outstanding. So what I use the shares outstanding is really the, the fully diluted ones because they have some stock options. So uh, that, that, uh, that I think is, is much uh, cleaner. I think that uh, demonstrate the value a, a lot better as well. So you get, a, I think, a fair value of uh, $30, a fair value of $30. Um, so this is a company that uh, um, been spending a lot of time. In fact, I was so ready to hold it for many years because um, I see that as a de facto standard, the gold standard like, Whoever wants to do an R&D project, they would always go to Himacare because of GMP uh, compliance, the ability to have recallable donor base, the ability to supply blood within a short period of time. A lot of times when you go to other players, you know, you want certain blood type, it's either they don't have it or you're going to take a long time, three to four weeks. And as I'm doing my R&D project, I can't wait. I need it soon. I need it now. So for that fact, I think Himacare has built its reputation really, really uh, uh, well. Um, so, you know, I, I prepared the slides, uh, I was uh, ready to share with you and uh, <laughs> I, I also know that uh, probably this is an industry that not many people know, mm -hmm. uh, but something really sad uh, happened yesterday. <laughs> Very sad, I wouldn't call it sad even. <laughs> something uh, really uh, it's quite sad happened. <laughs> Alright, <laughs> so uh, Charles River Laboratories, which is a listed company, I think about 7 billion market cap US dollars, mm -hmm. decided to acquire Himacare. So that was yesterday, uh, 16 <laughs> December. Was really quite sad. I, I, I have to say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, they actually wanted to acquire Himacare at about uh, twenty five dollars forty cents mm -hmm. uh, per share, mm -hmm. and yesterday uh, the share price have actually uh, reacted, have gone up to about twenty five dollars. Um, I I I have the firmless conviction behind this company becoming eventually a one billion dollar market cap business, but right now it's been acquired. Mm. And I think uh, $25.40, I, I, you know, just kind of like lost for words. And in fact, 
in the acquisition document, yeah. uh, it was being shared that uh, Hima Care actually gave the management guarantees to grow at 30% for the next four to five years. They wow. were quite confident about that. And that industry is going to grow about four to six times in terms of the addressable market, the client space that they can, they can sell to. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, um, because you know, in the past, I, I bought this company called Auric Pacific, right? Okay. Um, they sell the SES uh, butter, they sell Sunshine Bread, uh, they deal with Telefrance Food Junction as well. I knew that the company was worth more as well. And then uh, it was privatized by the Riley family at $1.65. <laughs> so, the feeling sucks, right? Uh, <laughs> but but um, it's, it's still all right, I guess, I guess, because uh, throughout the process, I, I've learned a lot more about the industry, about gene and cell therapy. And, you know, although it's already privatized, I, I, I still feel that uh, there could be some play, players that could do really, really well. Yeah. But uh, generally, I would say I would avoid uh, companies that are in business models of hit and misses, right? Yeah. Like, like Novartis, if they don't do well, the drug doesn't get uh, commercialized. I think that's the issue, right? So again, I'm going back to the shower uh, concept whereby something more stable, you always have this reoccurring need because there's always R&D uh, process that's always being done. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely an unfortunate uh, case that they're getting privatized. And I, I know that we have been already talking about uh, you coming on to the, to the episode and you have already uh, prepared a lot of work into sharing this uh, Hima care with, uh, with our audience. It's really unfortunate. Just one day before our shooting, uh, they, they came up with the news that it's going to be privatized. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <stressed. laughs> but I, I guess it's still congratulations to you <laughs> for, for, for finding this company. And I think we have a great uh, chat with you to really understand your thought process and into the detail that you go into when you're analyzing, especially micro caps, uh, where the news uh, and information about such companies is really hard to come by. Right, like, like you said before, if I want to analyze Google or, or Facebook, uh, just from the web, I, I can find tons of research ab about them and uh, you know, we, without even speaking to the management. But uh, in, in this case, you really, you really put in the work uh, to, to, to have to dig through the information and finding more about the industry. And uh, this, I think you should really pat yourself on the back uh, for, 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 for the amount of work that you have done for this company. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I guess one of the beauty about investing in microcaps as well, the business tends to be a lot simpler to understand. And if you reach out to the CEO, they are quite willing mm. to actually call and, and have a conversation with you. Yeah. So I, I, I guess a lot of times, um, you know, in investing, we have a few age, right? One mm. is behavior age, right? For example, uh, when the stock market, when when the prices go down, and you know, you you, you because you know our stuff, you have the conviction, you don't you don't panic. That's the behavior age. Second, I think it's informational age. So um, the way I look at it is that a lot of information out there, but if we call the management, we are able to derive uh, some unique insights. Uh, we are actually having that information age. And lastly, I think it's about analytical analytical age. Hmm. So perhaps I think when we speak to many investors um, and also, I mean, like both you and I, I think a lot of times um, we do analyze information quite differently as well. Um, so I'm just trying to uh, become better in all these three different uh, 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 domain because a lot of times I think times have changed I think technology have changed a lot um, you could screen I could screen and where can we uh, derive the additional alpha returns uh, so yeah. I, I've been always trying to work on that and hopefully become better every day yeah uh, I guess before we before we end uh, do you mind sharing a little bit about your own uh, maybe portfolio strategy because you said that you focus a lot on micro caps, uh, and micro caps themselves, um, number one, they, the information is uh, less less readily available, and also they tend to be uh, slightly more risky in nature. Most of them, uh, by the way. So, so how do you manage your portfolio? How, uh, actually, how many stocks do you own to feel comfortable with it, uh, and and how do you manage your risk within your portfolio? Okay. Mm. I would I wouldn't advise like anyone to actually follow anything that that I, I do and at the end of the day it's really about formulating your own uh, investment uh, strategy which you are comfortable with that, and that goes along with a uh, portfolio allocation as well. Um, I think starting out, uh, I, I can be uh, really uh, honest that I I actually took over my mom's uh, portfolio and I got into uh, Valutronics, Singapore, Startup, and I think they were doing quite well. I was holding about eight to nine stocks, uh, uh, in the beginning. And I, I read about this book, it's called uh, The Winning Habits of George Soros and Warren Buffett. 
And what I got out of it is that um, it may not be a popular uh, thing to say, but they say that uh, diversification is for the ignorance. Meaning, you know, if you do not know what you're doing, then it's probably uh, good to diversify. Mm. But uh, if you really know what you're doing, then I think concentration is something that is very, very important. Um, so it took me some time and, and I wasn't ready to say that. But as I went through my own mistakes uh, and also got to look, learn a bit more as well, I mean, sometimes the way I look at it, if I have like 10 companies, but probably out of the 10, five is my best ideas. And I know that they tend to do uh, really well. I mean, I have the conviction behind that. So why would I want to hold 10, you know, when I can hold five? And I think it's easier for me to track. But again, um, in terms of managing risk, uh, I would say that um, it will be more volatile because each stock holds a bigger uh, a percentage of your portfolio. Uh, but I guess it's also very important that any ideas that I have that I generate, I actually put through uh, my uh, inner circle of uh, friends, investors, full-time investors to kind of get what their thoughts on and really spend a lot of due diligence. Um, sometimes I think that it's kind of crazy, but that, that level of detailedness to actually understand about the company, have talks with the management and really, I think when it comes to investing in stocks, it's really being uh, unreasonable in your selection process. Yeah. So being unreasonable meaning what? like. Do we want to content ourselves with, let's say, a company that's growing at 5%, 10%? Do we, should we feel like good about the company? Or do we think a company is growing at having an ROE of 15%? Do you think that's good? Or having a, a high capex ratio is good, you know? Mm -hmm. But when we choose in our heart to say that we are here to only choose nothing but the best quality companies, then I, I just say that within a year, if we can find one or two great companies, um, my job is done, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like if you look at Berkshire today, right? 25% of Berkshire's uh, worth is actually in, in Apple um, mm. company itself. And Buffett in the past uh, bought 50%, I think in Amex as well. Mm. But again, he, he didn't do that because he was new, but he did that because he had the firmest conviction, done tremendous amount of work on it as well. Um, so, um, but I, I do see increasingly uh, people who are full-time investors, they kind of tend to have a concentrated portfolio. I think that's the way to go. but. If you don't have a lot of time to to, to manage, I would say uh, nine to ten because you ultimately want to spread your risk across. And but there's one risk that we cannot diversify away is actually the unknown unknowns. <laughs> yeah, like there are certain things which are like black swans yeah. that you can you can never know lah. So um, um, I, and I also have this really uh, strong uh, uh, emphasis on growth companies because um, you know. Sometimes when I buy companies, I may, because, you know, if this company is really good quality, it, it grows really well, then it would not trade at an undervalued price, probably fair price or maybe slightly overvalued. And I have to ask myself this question, right? Am I willing to underwrite and pay a high price for a company like that? Because mm. I think the biggest mistake is that people look at a company and think that, oh, the value is high. But if we do consider the growth of the business, then it probably doesn't look that bad, yeah. right? And I think, uh, for me, I, I I tend to buy companies at fair value, but I like companies that have a huge growth potential ahead of them because I can buy something that is fair value, but as long as it grows really well in the future, looking back, the price that I purchased could be seen as, as cheap. So that has always been my approach. And um, I mean, like starting out, I actually did, did make some of the uh, quite big mistakes. So I just want to share one of my mistakes that I've committed. It's actually this company in, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a property management company called Zhong Ao Holdings. Mm. So unlike Singapore, right? In Singapore, we talk about condos. If you don't pay your property management fees, you get a fine, you get an interest uh, on it, like 10% mm -hmm. like every month sort of thing, right? So people tend to pay up on time. But in China, you know, it's so huge. And a lot of times people buy properties for investment purposes. They may not live there and they may not go back at all. Mm. So uh, months and months of property management fees are not being paid. Hmm. So while contractually and accounting wise, uh, Zong Ao could actually report revenue, could report profit, but you look at the cash flow portion, it's actually uh, not very good. Right. Because a lot of receivables start piling up. Right. And they try all ways to collect the money, but can't collect. And uh, you know, that their business didn't do well. And I think very early on, that's one of the mistakes that I've learned. 
So which is why I have this mantra of really being unreasonable, like choosing the best companies. And even when there's no best companies, I, I, I'm willing to be patient on that because um, money definitely is hard earned and I and really want to allocate to the best companies possible. Yep. Wow. Thank you so much for, for your time, Kelvin. That's definitely a lot of nuggets of uh, wisdom uh, in what you said and, and in the stock that you present today. Uh, so once again, this is a co-founder of a 10x Capital Private Limited, Kevin Sito. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you are feeling generous, please give us a rating and review as well. This would greatly help other investors find out about our podcast. To access our show notes, please go to valueinvestasia.com slash investing ideas and be sure to sign up for our email newsletter for more outstanding content and reports about investing. The show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as investment advice. Please seek professional advice or do your own research when making any investment decision.